Dear Cameron Newton, I do believe I can beat you. No joke. No laugh until you cry. I do. I'm relentless. Can you feel this? I'm going all in. It's time to cash in. One moment in time. Let's get at this. Be tremendous. Relentless. I'm relentless. Here we go. This is the Skip Bayless Show, episode 107. This is always is the unundisputed everything I cannot share with you during the two and a half hour debate show that is undisputed. Today, I will fire back at Cam Newton again. Today, I will talk about race, that taboo topic. And I, no doubt, will be called a racist for even bringing up race as it pertains to Caitlin Clark. And today, I will once again first guess yet another ingenious LeBron excuse planting strategy. No, LeBron, I will not let you get away with this one either. But first up, as always, it is not to be skipped. I'm going to start with one of your questions. This is from Van from North Carolina. Be honest. How many shots did you miss that the video did not show? Okay, for those who might just be joining us for the first time, Cam Newton did take a shot at my opinion of Anthony Edwards' game-saving chase-down block, concluding that if I can't hit my head on the rim, as Anthony Edwards had to duck his head under the rim, I should just shut up, said Cam Newton. He started it. And then I responded. I responded by saying, I'd like to see Cam hit his head on the rim or duck under it because I'm pretty sure he can't. Then I said, I think I could beat Cam Newton in a three-point horse contest, as in H-O-R-S-E as in the shooting game horse. And that if I did, using Cam's logic back to me, then he should never again be allowed to critique any NBA player's shooting. It's fair. Not really, but that's Cam's logic. Then Cam tweeted back at me, challenge accepted as in, I think, three-point shooting challenge or maybe hitting head on rim or both. I'm going to accept that the challenge accepted was the three-point shooting contest. So I then responded by posting a video taken a week ago Monday of me shooting three-point shots in a little gym I frequent here in L.A., not far from the Fox Studios lot in which I now sit. And Cam responded with a tweet that basically patted me on the head and said, nice try. Cam tweeted, and I quote, no crowd, no distractions, no pressure, edited video, all this equals not impressed. But I am impressed with the fact that you really, all caps, think you can beat me, cap M, cap E, and then laughing, crying emoji. End of tweet. 
Dear Cameron Newton, I do believe I can beat you. No joke. No laugh until you cry. I do. But you are right about this. That was just me and my wife, Ernestine, in that little gymnasium. There was not a hundred million people watching you lose a Super Bowl on television, another hundred thousand watching you lose a Super Bowl in the stadium. And I definitely was not being chased and sacked into oblivion by Von Miller as you were in that Super Bowl. But I do beg to differ about pressure. I did know going in, if I posted that video of me shooting threes, that it would be watched by millions of people. That little gym I frequent is difficult to book. It is always busy. It is highly used. Difficult to get alone time in that little gymnasium. By the time my wife Ernestine and I got there, we had about 20 minutes. I hadn't shot for a while, so the first 10 or so minutes, I I just needed to warm up, regain my stroke and my eye, my rhythm. And to Van's question that opened this topic, I don't know. I, I missed a lot of shots as I warmed up. I probably missed 60 to 70% of my threes as I warmed up. But once Ernestine started recording about 10 minutes in with 10 minutes left, the pressure I felt was extreme. I could not stay, quote unquote, cold, hit or miss cold. Or we would just simply run out of time to fully shoot the video that I I needed to shoot, that I wanted to shoot, that I thought would be required to post. So I, I did not actually count my misses in the final 10 minutes of the shooting. But I'm being, Van, 1,000% honest with you, straight from the bottom of my heart. When I, I'm going to conservatively tell you I made six of the 10 shots she filmed. I had to track down my own makes and misses, go set up again at another three-point shooting spot on the floor. We tried all of them and posted, I guess, five of them. Maybe I hit seven of the next 10. It was somewhere in that ballpark. No exaggeration. I did heat up as I regularly do when I shoot threes. I can shoot Cam Newton. You can ask people I used to play with, play against, one-on-one, two-on-two, the great Roger Staubach back in my Dallas days, Dennis Thurman, Dexter Klinkscale, the Cowboys played a lot of basketball with, especially with Dexter. The great Nancy Lieberman, Lady Magic. I'm going to get to her in just a few minutes here on this show, but Used to play basketball quite a bit with her back in her glory days with the Dallas Diamonds. She lived three doors down from me. They saw me in action. You can ask them if I can shoot. I I can shoot. Heck, you you can even ask a, a minister, a pastor. Jim Townsley, Central Baptist in Bristol, Connecticut, former one on one partner of mine. Great little gym they have there. I can shoot. And as my wife, Ernestine, will attest, I did come through under at least pressure that I was feeling before we had to vacate that gym a week ago Monday. 
but Cam, you are right. The the video was obviously edited in that Ernestine sent only my makes to Jonathan Berger, our showrunner here on the Skip Bayless show. She did not send my, I don't know, three or four misses that she also filmed. And you're right, Cam, Jonathan Berger did edit five of the six makes that Ernestine sent Jonathan Berger, edited those five into the video that did go viral as I expected it would when we posted it. But for the record, Cam, there was no doctoring. There was no video magic used on my makes. There's no CGI, no dude perfect. Those made threes are as real as Caitlin Clark's were on television the other day against LSU. Those shots left my hand and they went in, they splashed, they ripped the cord, swish, Bayless. But Cam, if you don't believe me, you're more than welcome to come and try me with the whole sports world watching. W- would I choke? Maybe. Probably. Almost certainly. Almost certainly. Then again, Cam, speaking of pressure, imagine the humiliation. Imagine the ridicule. If you, all caps, Cameron Newton, lost to some old white guy more than twice your age? Insert here, laughing, crying emoji. Another question comes from Kai from Los Angeles. What shoes do you use to play basketball in? Good question. Embarrassing answer, but true. By the way, in that shooting video that we posted, I did wear one of my favorite pair of Jordans. It, it really is. It's my favorite pair. It's my, my 11s, the Concords, black and white, the high tops. They felt good, but I wasn't actually playing basketball. As I've said before, Jordans are not to be played in. If you do wear them to play basketball, you're going to get played. To this day, I marvel at, at how the greatest player ever in any sport actually played basketball and dominated the NBA in the ones. There's just no cushion at all. There's no stability at all in the ones. You know, the phrase rock bottom. I mean, (laughs) the ones have rock bottoms. You, you, You literally feel like you're playing on rocks, jumping off rocks, landing on rocks. I don't get it. Never got it. Love my Jordans. Wear them every day on Undisputed. They are to be seen, not heard screeching on the basketball court. Blister City. So, I'll admit this is a little embarrassing, but this is what I play in. If you're actually watching right now, I think we'll flash them up. I have these feelers, and don't ask me how I stumbled into them, but they are simply the greatest basketball sneakers ever made, according to me, according to my feet, my size 11s. I stumbled into them for reasons unknown and I, I don't know, 2009, maybe, 2008 or 9. 
and I love them so much, I immediately bought two more pairs. So I've got three pair. I rotate them to play. This is when I'm playing one-on-one. This is hardcore basketball playing. I wear my feelers. If you're seeing them, they're just your basic red, white, and blue. I got white stripes on the blue, then white sides, red bottoms. Nothing to look at. I, I wouldn't wear them out. I definitely wouldn't wear them on Undisputed. But they are so light, yet so strong, so stable, so springy. They, they fit like gloves. And you, you have to understand, all I care about in the end, when I'm playing basketball, all-out basketball, like psycho competitive basketball, all I care about is my health. That's all. Period. End of story. Because I, I cherish my ability to run, to lift. I, I just don't want to get hurt. So what I play in has nothing to do with fashion or style, just with safety. I feel safe in my feelings. I, I, I feel like I can dunk in my feelings. Well, almost dunk. I love those feelings, but I'm embarrassed to tell you that I do. Okay, buckle up for this one, and I'll do the same. Bear with me. I'm going to talk about Caitlin Clark and Paul Pierce and race, which almost certainly means I will be called racist because race is a taboo topic in this country. You talk about it publicly, you're a racist. So be it. Call me a racist. I don't care. I really do not care. As a white guy, you just, you can't talk publicly about race. Can't win. Can't win with some white people. Can't win with some black people. And I don't care. Because I have always believed it's important to talk about race. Always believed it. Never been afraid to. Black and white. There I said it. Black and white. If I'm a racist, I'm a racist. So to understand exactly where I'm about to come from, you have to understand where I came from, where I was raised. I've told this story in bits and pieces before. I'm going to hit it one more time. I was the oldest of three kids. Grew up in a broken home. Two parents wrecked by alcohol abuse and addiction. So I often wound up having to stay at my grandmother's. And my grandmother traveled for her work. She didn't have a lot of money. But she did have a woman who worked for her full time who ran the household. And that woman's name was Katie Bell Henderson. She was as tough as she was sweet. Came to my hometown of Oklahoma City from the south side of Chicago, where she grew up. Her parents came from Alabama to Chicago. And Katie Bell raised me. And I know what you're going to say is right out of the movie The Help, right off the plantation. Nope, nope, double nope, not. This is middle class Oklahoma City. Katie Bell ran that household. She was entrusted. She was empowered. She was as much the matriarch of that house as my grandmother was. 
and Katie Bell raised me. She was much more of a mother to me than my mother ever was or could be. Katie Bell taught me everything I know about right and wrong, about life, and certainly about black and white. I spent a lot of time with Katie Bell. Watched all of her favorite shows with her, from Gunsmoke to Edge of Night, favorite soap opera. And I loved that woman because she loved me and she believed in me. She occasionally took me to her church, which was an all black church on the northeast side of town. And they treated me like a little prince and I was the only white face in that congregation. It was a great experience for me. Learned a lot, felt a lot. I, I would not be sitting here if not for Katie Bell Henderson. Trust me on that. I would have gone wrong, but she kept me right. She taught me right. She was tough on me, often called me a hypocrite. I had to look that word up to figure out what it really meant. But I was and could be. But the point was, she made me see the world the way it should have been seen. We all came from the same God. We're all pieces of God. We just got raised differently. We're different people, different cultures, but we're all pieces of God. And I've carried that in my heart ever since. And maybe, maybe that's why in my career, I've always been at least as comfortable being around black people as white people, maybe even more so, I don't know. But my debate partners throughout my 20 years on television have almost always been black. Starting back in my earliest days on ESPN, the late, great Ralph Wiley from Sports Illustrated on the old Jim Rome show. Then on Cold Pizza with Rob Parker and Jamel Hill, Michael Smith, Chris Broussard, Two Live Stews. Then onward and upward with my brother, Stephen A. Here at FS1 with Shannon Sharp. And now with Keyshawn and Michael Irvin, Richard Sherman on Undisputed. Which brings me to Paul Pierce, now contributing regularly for us during the NBA season and playoffs. So the other day, we reacted to Caitlin Clark's sensational game, victory over LSU. None of us saw it coming. We all predicted that LSU would win the game. I said the day before the game, I'm sorry, the day of the game, I was shocked that I was favored by a point and a half, could not see it, could not buy into it. And so the morning after, these are the words that Paul Pierce spoke on live TV on Undisputed. He said of Caitlin Clark's performance, we saw a white girl in Iowa do it to a bunch of black girls. That gained my respect. I didn't expect that. She didn't do this to some other little white girls that were over in Colorado or wherever. She did it to some girls from LSU who we thought were dogs, the defending champs. Put them on their knee and spanked them. I did not expect that, said Paul Pierce on Undisputed. Paul then proclaimed, Caitlin Clark's performance as the single greatest performance by a man or a woman 
in any NCAA championship game, in any March Madness setting, any setting in college basketball history, the greatest game ever under that circumstance. Iowa had lost by 17 last year in the national championship game to LSU. Greatest game ever, said Paul Pierce, who obviously played at the highest level in winning a championship with and for the Boston Celtics. Okay, so think with me for a moment. Where is Paul coming from? Okay, so he did play for the Celtics for the most part. Transitioned to Wizards and Clippers later, but he was a Celtic, as we know. 2008 champion Celtic. So what what does Paul Pierce know about black and white as it pertains to basketball? Well, he knows Larry Bird, because everybody knows Larry Bird, greatest white player ever. We're talking about American white player. I certainly know Larry Bird, but I knew great white players before Larry Bird. I definitely knew Pistol Pete Maravich, my favorite player in high school. Could he play? Oh. If only you could have seen him play the way I saw him play live twice. Would have dominated the NBA the way he dominated college basketball. Except for alcohol issues that he suffered. There was the great Jerry West, the logo. There was my friend Rick Barry. What a gazelle he was. What a gifted scorer he was. There was the great Bill Walton who dominated both college and pro basketball. And then there was Larry Bird. We'd never seen anything like Larry Bird. Started with Bird versus Magic. An estimated 35 million watched that game that night. I was there, Salt Lake City. They put the Final Four on the map in that championship game in 1979. And the world watched because there was a great white hope that wasn't a great white hype. There was Larry Joe Bird from French Lick, Indiana, hick from the sticks, who could flat out play basketball at six feet, nine inches tall with an unblockable shot. Great passer, wily defender, shrewd scorer winner versus Magic Johnson, as charismatic an athlete as we've ever seen this side of Muhammad Ali. His billion dollar, billion watt smile. They went up against each other. Magic got the best of him in part because Magic had Gregory Kelser, who was also going to play in the NBA, and Larry Bird had nobody. But it was a spectacle. It was epic. It was revolutionary. And the world watched because I'm sure a whole lot of white people rooted for Larry Bird and a whole lot of black people rooted for Magic Johnson. A ratings record that remains untouchable. 35 million people watched it. Black and white. Nothing wrong with that, but that's what it was. So guess what happened after Larry Bird? White America. Not much. Not much. John Stockton happened. He's a Hall of Famer. One of the greatest passers ever. Chris Mullen happened. Mark Price happened. And no, nothing else really happened. Kevin Love happened here lately. See a Hall of Famer? Not in my book. Very good player. We're just talking about white American players. There hasn't been anything close to Larry Bird. Not anything close. There, there is no next Larry Bird. Hasn't been. L- look at what we got now. Best 
American players. Just talking about American white players. Well, there's Tyler Hero. There's Austin Reeves. He's pretty good for the Lakers. Maybe Chet Holmgren's going to be pretty good. Maybe, maybe very good. I like him. One of the first white seven foot or above players, American players drafted that I'll buy into. Because if you look back at the history of that position, white Americans, seven foot plus, bust city. Now we got Grayson Allen. We got TJ McConnell. Hey, we got Max Struess. We got Kevin Herter. How about Duncan Robinson? He's pretty good. He can really shoot it. Pat Connaughton. Pajemski looks like he's going to be pretty good for the Warriors. DiVincenzo for the Knicks, ex-Warrior. They're all pretty good, but nothing close to Larry Bird. That's what Paul knows. That's what he's known. Larry Bird retired in 1992. Nothing like him. Now, the Euro players, that's a whole different ball game. Steve Nash is from Canada. Grew up playing soccer in Canada. Won back-to-back MVPs. I thought Shaq should have won one of them, but... He won two in a row, did Steve Nash. Not American. As we speak, there's Luca, There's Joker. There's Giannis. Let's just stay with the Caucasian persuasion. Let's stay with Luca and Joker. Euro players. Great players. Great that you can argue they're the two best players we have going today. They're white, but they didn't grow up in this country. Highly skilled. Play a whole different flavor of basketball. Below the rim. Genius creativity. Genius level skill. Feel. Command of the game of basketball. Never seen anything quite like them, but they, they're not from here. Love them, but they're not from here. So think of Paul Pierce's perspective. That's that's all he knows. Now, what Paul doesn't know, because he hasn't followed women's basketball the way I have, is he doesn't know the history of women's basketball because there have been a lot of really, really good white female players over the years in college basketball and then on into the WNBA. And I'm going to start the woman I mentioned earlier, Nancy Lieberman, Lady Magic, as she was called back in the day when I was in Dallas and she played for the Dallas Diamonds. She was the number one pick in that draft. She was something, Lady Magic. Could she ever pass the basketball? Had some Pistol Pete in her. Not a great shooter, but a great scorer. A great controller of basketball games with a great handle. She grew up little Jewish girl, far Rockaway, New York, out in Long Island, taking the train into Harlem to play against the black kids, the black males. She'd be the only female. That's how she honed her skills and her toughness. She was something, Lady Magic. And then so many UConn greats, Rebecca Lobo and Sue Bird and Diana Taurasi and Brianna Stewart. She was player of the year three straight years at UConn. These are white girls, Kelsey Plum and Sabrina, who just went up against Steph in the three-point contest and Paige Beckers now for UConn. A lot of great white girls. Paul didn't have great command of that. But you have to understand that, that Paul... Watch Caitlin go up uh, up against a, a team from LSU with four black starters, one white. You watch Caitlin, who's of course white, with three other white starters and just one black starter. And Paul's saying, man, degree of difficulty here is high because I still think LSU – just has a better overall team than Iowa. In fact, I think it's a lot better if we talk 10 deep. Caitlin Clark just took the game over because we've never seen anything quite like Caitlin Clark. We could argue all day and all night about who's the greatest female player ever, and you could make all kinds of cases that would be hard to dispute, but 
the greatest distance shooter we've ever seen by far is Caitlin Clark. She is logo threes on cue, under pressure. Gotta make them, does. She is a gifted passer. Maybe not LeBron, who's got the gift. Maybe not quite Stockton, but she's in the ballpark with Stockton. And that combination of long-distance shooting and the ability to dime is extraordinary. Her mental and physical toughness is extraordinary. Her ability to make her teammates better, a whole lot better than they deserve to be, is extraordinary. Her team, not better than LSU's, but just because of her, they were better. And they won handily, just as they had been beaten decisively by somewhat the same team. They added, obviously, Haley Van Lith as their point guard. But pretty much the same team, led by Angel Reese, just romped and stomped in the championship game. It was 102 to 85 last year. Caitlin Clark is special. Never th- seen anything quite like her. And I can make a case. She's going to have to close this deal coming up here Friday and Sunday. UConn, and then if they get past UConn, obviously South Carolina, undefeated. If she can close that case, boy, you can make a strong case. She's the greatest ever. So I mentioned that Pete Maravich was my favorite player growing up, and he was obviously white. Could I relate to him better? Not not really. I, I didn't care. I just never saw the world that way. Once I became an NBA fan, my favorite player was George the Iceman Gervin for my San Antonio Spurs back in the day. Finger rolls, creative shot making. I, I was mesmerized watching the Iceman ice people. In the end, I've never really cared about the color at all. I see color because it's just life. I don't obsess with color, but I know that the black people and the white people, when it comes to basketball, are a little different. They're going to go at the game a little differently. That doesn't mean the white people can't play, but I came to accept post Larry Bird that black people in general, in general, I'm stereotyping, generalizing, but in general, I'm sorry, I think we all could agree that black people have been a little better at basketball than white people. I could make a case that black people have been a lot better at basketball than white people. I can close that case with the fact that Paul Pierce played in an NBA that was about 80% black. And I just ran down the list of current white quote unquote stars in the NBA, other than Kevin Love at the backside of his career. Black people have just been better at basketball than white people. Doesn't bother me at all to say it. I just love basketball. I just want to watch the best. I don't care who they are, what color they are, where they came from. If it's Luka, if it's Joker, whatever. If it's Caitlin, whatever. Did I root for Caitlin because she's white? I absolutely did not. Was I mesmerized by her performance? You better believe it. And I gave it up to her the way I rarely give it up to anybody on Undisputed, as did Paul Pierce. But of course, from what I was told, I don't read it. I don't respond to it. But the internet, you know, obviously the internet sort of condemned us as racist for even discussing race on Undisputed. And I had absolutely no problem with anything Paul Pierce said. 
I know exactly where he was coming from, and I know who he is. He wasn't being racist. He was just being real. Same for me. Again, we all three picked LSU because we just knew LSU was better. But Caitlin rose above us, rose above LSU, rose above Kim Mulkey and Angel and Flage and Morrow and Williams. That, that team is loaded. Speaking of Kim Mulkey, I started watching video of the game that was for 41 years the highest rated women's basketball game ever, highest rated on television, 1983 NCAA Finals featuring Kim Mulkey as the little spark plug pint-sized point guard of Louisiana Tech going up against Cheryl Miller, sister of Reggie and the USC Trojans. Cheryl, the best player in basketball that year by far against the little white point guard from Louisiana. It stood for 41 years. as the most watched women's game ever. Why was that? You know why it was. It had black and it had white. And there's nothing wrong with that. And just because a lot of white people rooted for Kim Mulkey, that doesn't mean they're racist. And because a lot of people in the black community rooted for Cheryl Miller, obviously doesn't mean they're racist. Are some of them? Yes, some. Are a whole lot of white people? Yes, you got me. As I always say, racism is obviously alive and hell in this country. But that's not what we're talking about here. In the end, I, I love working with Paul Pierce. I, I like his heart. I like his view. I appreciate his fearless opinions. And I appreciated how he just laid it right out on that debate desk about what he saw, which was a white girl in Iowa do it to a bunch of black girls. She did. She did that. And I just appreciate the opportunity to talk about it because I think it's important. I don't think it divides to talk race. I think it unites. That's what I've always believed. And trust me, I thank God for Katie Bell Henderson. Okay, speaking of March Madness, it is time quickly for me to review my March Badness picks, which were predictably laughable as I predicted they would be when I made them right here on this show. As I always say, knowledge and logic are not your friends when it comes to picking March Madness. I did take one long shot. You got to try one in what I thought was the weakest region, the West. One dark horse, one Cinderella. I took St. Mary's. You know why? Because they had lost only one game since Christmas, and I had just watched them wire to wire beat Gonzaga in their conference tournament final. It was 69 to 60, but it wasn't that close. And I thought Gonzaga was pretty good. And I thought St. Mary's was so well coached, so veteran, so skilled, with a very good conference player of the year, Euro player, Augustus Marshallonis, son of a great Golden State warrior who used to be a favorite of mine back in the day. 
I thought, I'm going to ride this dark horse. I tweeted five minutes into their first game. It was a 5-12 seed. They were the five seed against 12 seed Grand Canyon. I tweeted five minutes into the game that the Gales were toast. It was a terrible matchup for them. They weren't quick enough. They weren't physical enough. And they got run off the floor. They hung in in the second half, but it wasn't really close. I'm not saying it was a mismatch, but I was so wrong about St. Mary's, who drew such a bad 5-12 matchup. And they're obviously classic upsets every year from the 5-12. I loved Iowa State. Watched them a lot. Big 12. Watched them beat the best team in the Big 12, Houston. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take a flyer on Iowa State to to shock UConn in that East. A deliberate defensive team. And all of a sudden they run into in the Sweet 16, Illinois, and they could not score. They just could not score. I knew 10 minutes into that game, this is not going to work. They hung in and hung on and scrapped and scratched and clawed. The final was 72 to 69, but it didn't feel that close. So much for Iowa State. So I would picked Houston to win it all. They were in the South. They're better than Duke. Sweet 16 game. And their best player, Houston's best player, player I thought would be the most outstanding player of the Final Four, Jamal Shedd, badly turned his ankle late in the first half, and Houston was history. Duke prevailed, which left me with one last Final Four pick, standing Purdue, which was not standing a year ago when it lost to a 16 seed. I thought Purdue would be on some new mission And they have been. It's a very good team. Edie can play. If they can get by the true Cinderella that nobody saw coming, or very few, North Carolina State, they, quote, unquote, will get to play UConn, invincible, dominating UConn in the final. It's projected that Purdue would be a five and a half point favorite. And I figure they'll lose that game by 20. You heard it here first and last. This is Mike from Miami. How will you react when LeBron finally does retire? Man, will I ever miss him. I'm not saying life will end. I'm not saying I will retire because I will not. But I will miss him because I'm going to say it again. He's the most interesting man in all of sports. I can make a case. He has become the most interesting man in the history of sports. Ali is up there for me because I knew him, loved him. He's my favorite sports star when I was a kid. I had two pictures on my wall, two posters. The old Sports Illustrated posters of Ali and Joe Namath. Both against the grain. Did it their way. Ali was fascinating on so many levels. But LeBron is, is fascinating every single night. Every Laker game has some new LeBron subplot to it some new creative angle I did not see coming. I, I don't think it's premeditated by LeBron. I just think he has a force field around him that just breeds fascination on a nightly basis. But as far as have I thought about LeBron retiring, I, I have not. I know it comes up occasionally because he'll bring it up. As a humble brag, well, I'm almost finished, and I just hit nine out of ten threes at Brooklyn. But I'm I'm almost ready to retire. It's coming sooner than later. Humble brag. He's not. 
He's 39 going on 29. He loves this. I, I think he loves hooping more now than he ever has. He, he's building a longevity legacy because it's his only hope against Jordan in the GOAT debate. There is no debate to me, but he's, he's building this sort of living monument to sustain greatness, and I can't argue with that. It's all he has, but he's got that. I mean, come on. Greatest scorer ever, 40,000 points. That's even more impressive, has a more impressive ring to it than greatest scorer ever, 40,000 points. But of course, that doesn't mean that we suddenly get to, to wipe away all the epic failures in the, in the GOAT debate. I mean, he still remains four and six in the finals six times. Of course, Jordan won all six of his with six MVPs, and LeBron's lost six times. Those meltdowns against Paul Pierce's Celtics and 2010 against Dallas, his first go around with the Heat in the finals in 2011. Against my Spurs in 20, really the end of game six, 2013, and then all of the finals in 14 when they got blown off the floor by record finals margin. We can't just expunge that. We can't just cleanse his resume just because he scored 40,000 points. I mean, he has played 15,000 more minutes than Jordan did. 15,000 more minutes? And he does remain a 74% free throw shooter, which is, is embarrassing for a player of his magnitude. Can't make free throws. He can make threes now. It's career high 42%. I think he got in the lab to fix his three-point stroke, but the free throw stroke? So one shot's from 25 feet. The other one's from 15, and you can't do that unguarded? I don't get it, but... That disqualifies him alone. That alone disqualifies him from being the GOAT. But interesting, hmm. Jordan couldn't hold a candle on the interesting scale to LeBron James. So now we've got Paul Pierce speaking of on Undisputed proclaiming that if LeBron does pull off winning this championship, that he would have to be the GOAT. And I keep saying, why? We're just going to wipe away all the epic fails? I mean, I, I actually picked the Lakers to win this year's championship, and I had no hidden agenda. I, I just think they're that good. And on a fairly nightly basis here lately, they show you they're that good. Hope they get Gabe Vincent back. Regular form and rotation and rhythm. Maybe Jared Vanderbilt comes back to be a designated defender by playoff time. This is, this is a squad. This team is deep. This team is starting to make its threes. This team has firepower. But, but here comes LeBron again, right on schedule. The great media manipulator that he is, the master media manipulator, the genius media manipulator, excuse me, manipulator that he is, he's at it again. Because you realize he's played top five minutes per game in the league this year at age 39 in year 21. Top five minutes. He juggles back and forth, toggles, you might say, between fourth and fifth in minutes per game played. He and Donovan Mitchell now coming back off injury. They're both at 35-ish, 35.1, 35.2. But, but LeBron has been either fourth or fifth for most of the year. He, as we speak, he's in fifth. But top five in minutes played? That's what I call basketball suicide. It's what LeBron would call planting an excuse. 
All we heard before the season was, this is the year they're going to have to be smart with his minutes. This is the year they got to save LeBron from himself. They have to make sure his minutes are closer to 30 than 35 because they need to save him for what really matters, the playoffs. Playing all those minutes has not helped the Lakers as a team. It has only helped LeBron build his living monument to himself for sustained greatness. It's only helped pass 40,000 points and add more and more triple doubles or whatever he, stats he wants to add up that somehow will equal Jordan's 6-0 and in the finals, which it won't. But he is brilliantly planting yet another excuse for the postseason just in case he flames out. He flamed out hard last year. And all of his protectors, his defenders, his idolaters, his blind witnesses rushed to protect him, rushed to prop him back up after against Denver, four straight games, the Lakers had a shot to win the game going into the fourth quarter and through most of the fourth quarter. Four straight times, they played Denver to a draw until Joker and Jamal said, no, last couple of minutes, we got this. LeBron didn't got this. LeBron in those four fourth quarters last year was seven of 23. The man who just the other night made nine out of 10 threes at Brooklyn in those four fourth quarters combined went one of 10 from three in the games that mattered most against the eventual champion Denver Nuggets, two in Denver, two in LA. One of 10 from three in four fourth quarters combined. Horrendously bad. Indefensively awful. Yet all I heard was, well, he ran out of gas. His foot was bothering him. It bothered him all year. That's all. I, his ankles bother him now. He'll miss a game here and there. My ankles hurt. Okay, I, I got it. But all I hear, on the other hand, is you spend $2 million a year to keep yourself in the greatest shape of any professional athlete ever. LeBron is Iron Man. I'm going to knock on wood when I say this, but he's never had any surgeries on any knees or shoulders or Achilles. He's amazingly durable. And then you ran out of gas against Denver? No, you didn't. You hit the psychological wall. You fell apart in the fourth quarter. You've done it before and you did it again. You gagged. You gagged. I, I'm sorry, that's what happened. You just gagged. When your team needed you most, you gagged. Austin Reeves, your new running mate, he wanted the basketball in those four fourth quarters. He shot eight times in the four fourth quarters and made seven of them. He made all four of his threes. Maybe this time you should share the ball a little bit more with Austin Reeves. But you, I, I'm first guessing this. I'm warning you. I'm trying to enlighten you that LeBron has already planted the excuse brilliantly. Well, I played so many minutes. Well, you didn't have to, but you did. It, it's already haze in that barn. The barn you might try to burn to the ground if, in fact, you flame out against, let's say, Denver again in the conference finals. You flame out? Well, look, I, I played the fifth most minutes in the league. Whose fault is that? It's, it's yours, LeBron. I'm calling BS now. I'm first guessing this. I'm going to head you off at the pass that you make so brilliantly. I'm going to jump to a conclusion you're going to try to leap to later. You can't run out of gas. You cannot reach for the excuse that you just hit the physical wall. You look better than ever. Your body looks better than ever. You're playing at as high a level at 39 as you did at 29. No more excuses. Last question comes from Jason from Buffalo. Are, are you good at any winter sports like skiing or snowboarding? 
Jason, I'm sorry. I appreciate your question, but I am not. I hate snow. I hope never to experience snow again as long as I live. I did grow up in Oklahoma City. It snowed there like twice a year, every year. When it did, right down the street from where we lived, a street called Grand Boulevard, which, by the way, was a dirt road. There was a street that crossed it called 48th Street. And as you turn right off my little street onto 48th, there was a very steep hill going up to what was called Larissa Lane. So 48th going uphill, way uphill, to Larissa Lane, provided when it snowed and iced, quite a runway. So I did have a sled. I guess it was my version of Rosebud, if you know Citizen Kane. But I did have a sled, a little red sled. It was a piece of crap. I used it twice a year, and I hauled it all the way up 48th Street to the top, as did all the kids in the neighborhood. And I got on my sled, pushed myself off, and I flew down 48th Street. Whoopee! And it was fun once. It was okay twice. And then the third time, I'm thinking, this is boring. I don't want to have to put up with the snow just for this because one run and I'm basically done. It's like water skiing. I tried water skiing a couple of times. A little lake called Lake Owasi outside of Oklahoma City. Had a friend's boat. Skis. Took a while to get up out of the water if you've water skied. But once you get the hang of it, you get up on the skis. Then it's la-di-da, la-di-da, I'm looking around the lake. This is interesting, but kind of boring. And then I go right across the wake, and then I go left across the wake. And then I'm saying, is that all there is to water skiing? Well, to me, that would be all there is to snow skiing. A lot of my friends use snow skiing as a status symbol. Going skiing, going to Aspen, going to Vail, going to wherever they are. I have never, ever gone snow skiing because every friend I have who snow skis, every single one of them, I don't know, 10 or 12 of them, they've all had knee surgery caused by a snow skiing accident. Every one of them has had a torn ligament surgery because of a snow skiing accident. I threaten my knees enough playing basketball and running as much as I do. Distance running, treadmill running, running outside. Six, eight, nine, ten miles. I've had three knee scopes for torn meniscus. Two right, one left. Medial meniscus tears. Fortunately, I still have enough of the cartilage cushion in my knee that it keeps bone off bone, and I can still run. I I run a lot. Thank you, God. But the last thing I want to do is go snow skiing in Aspen and risk ACL surgery. My ligaments are still, knock on wood, intact. They're still strong. I'm talking about the ACL and the PCL and all the big ligaments that provide the stature in your knee joints. I can still run because my ACL is still strong. But snow skiing to me is daring the ACL devil. So living here in Los Angeles... I avoid snow, and I avoid snow skiing like it's COVID. I covered two Winter Olympics. I was there, Lake Placid. I was there in Sarajevo, 80 and 84. I'll watch the Winter Olympics on television. I just do not ever again want to participate in anything Winter Olympics. 
I'm sorry, Jason from Buffalo. I hate snow. That is it for episode 107. Thanks to you for listening and or watching. Thanks to Jonathan Berger and his all pro uh, crew for making this show go. Thanks to Tyler Korn for producing. Please remember, Undisputed is every weekday, 9.30 to noon Eastern, The Skip Bayless Show, every week.